For 26 years, Sri Lanka's earth cried relentlessly with dejection and melancholia as thousands of lives were lost in a war. A fierce psychosis prevailed. Sri Lanka remained in an abyss of stagnation. May 2009 saw the LTTE being militarily defeated. As a new day dawned, Sri Lanka awaited development. Fast forward a couple of years, 8th January 2015 saw the election of President Maitri Palasirisena. Subsequently, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. A promise was made to the Sri Lankan people to take Sri Lanka to an era of accelerated development. Good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Face the Nation. My name is Sonali Wanigabadge. Our topic of discussion today is slightly technical in nature. However, we invite you to stay with us as it impacts your life. We're discussing infrastructure development, sustainability, procurement and due process. Very quickly, let me introduce you to our guests. Mr. Lalita Siri Gunarwan, he's a senior lecturer at the University of Colombo and also the former secretary of the Ministry of Transport. Good evening and welcome to you. We're also joined by Mr. Nimal Chandra Siri. He's a former additional director general of the Road Development Authority and an engineer by profession. Good evening. Finally, Professor Rohan Samarajiva. He's the founding chair of Learn Asia. Good evening and welcome, Professor. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, Mr. Lalitha Siri Gunarwan, my first question is to you. Sri Lanka is moving into an era of rapid, accelerated development. Um, we keep seeing projects of magnificent proportions. Uh, when it comes to these mega infrastructure projects, such as highways, what are the procurement guidelines in application at the moment? Well, um, not only in highways, any public investment, there should be a thorough process of appraisal. Project preparation and planning is a must in public investment. If the people's money is to be uh, spent diligently, without waste, the ministries and their planning units as well as agencies, if you talk about RDA, then RDA has its own project preparation uh, cell and then the Ministry of Highways and then another stage in the macro level, it's the Department of National Planning under the Ministry of, uh, uh, those days it was under Finance and Planning, now it is under Policy, Planning and uh, something, Economic Affairs and that chain of uh, institutions should look into the feasibilities of these projects and plan the projects so that the maximum economic benefits be secured by implementing those projects with the minimum possible capital investment. Now there is a procedure which is laid down, which has been in practice for a long time, ever since the Bradford University report in 1984, which was uh, 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 institutionalized in the Department of National Planning. And even before, in our own way, there has been a procedure of uh, uh, appraising development projects and the approvals were granted only if the projects satisfy the required feasibility conditions. Now, if that kind of a procedure is implemented and also if the investment is diligently planned and implemented by way of competitive bidding and competitive procedure, then I think the chances of the projects being successful and the public money being done justice is greater. How successful is its implementation in the present day context? Well, as the whole country knows, I don't think we can be happy with the implementation procedure. Not only the project's implementation itself, but even the implementation of the planning procedure. I don't think anyone can be happy because most of the time these planning procedures are short-circuited for various reasons. And the projects which do not have the required feasibility levels and the capital efficiency are being implemented. <coughs> So, <clears throat> uh, where exactly are we going wrong, uh, Mr. Gunaruan? I think it starts from the project concept itself. 
the right project has to come into the, uh, uh, the, the, the conceiving stage. We need to appraise the possible uh, alternatives and once the project alternatives are appraised, then the right project has to emerge and then those projects will have to be, uh, those, those uh, rightful projects should be implemented with the due diligence of capital efficiency. Then only uh, we, can, we can achieve the, the objectives in the, in the best and optimum way. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Nimal Chandrasiri, um, I'd like you to draw your attention to the next question. Um, when it comes to the implementation of uh, processes guidelines, um, how successful are they in ensuring that um, there is minimum or uh, zero corruption? Oh. Let's say minimum corruption, I think zero corruption, I don't know whether it's available, it's existing in any, anywhere in the world. Uh, minimum corruption, I think best, uh, as uh, Gunagran said, I think uh, best thing is to have a very transparent uh, competitive bidding. That's the only possibility, uh, possible way to see that uh, there is a lot of competition and the best pr uh, price emerges for the project. So that uh, we get the maximum benefit out of the uh, situation. Um, well, that's hap hap that it was happening to a certain extent. And I'm, I, I'm not saying it was 100 uh, percent, but then say let's say at about 75 percent, it was happening uh, until we resorted to unsolicited proposals. So, with the unsolicited proposals, uh, the competitive bidding was no more, and. Uh, we found that uh, sometimes the uh, cost is uh, sort of, uh, in the engineering way, we found that the cost is very high uh, compared to normal competitive bidding prices and the engineer's estimate. We call it engineer's estimate because the, the engineers who formulate the project comes up with a certain uh, estimate of the cost. And uh, so the engineer's estimate was set aside and then uh, it was just a negotiated uh, contract, went into negotiated contracts through this unsolicited bidding. So that's where I think uh, we went wrong. Uh, but maybe there is a reason for unsolicited bidding. I am not saying that uh, it's completely uh, bad, but we should have been uh, more diligent about what's going on and uh, had some safeguards built in if we are going for unsolicited bidding, which was not there. Even not now, it's not there. Uh, Mr. Chandrasiri, um, even when we take uh, projects of large proportions, mega development projects, uh, we see that um, most often than not, uh, the proper procedures haven't really been followed as a result of which we're talking about billions of rupees of losses being caused to uh, the Sri Lankan public. The taxpayers' money is being wasted. Um, <clears throat> despite there being procedures, how, is, uh, how are these systems then being circumvented? Well, uh, not really circumvented, they are short-circuited, mostly. So you find a different way of uh, coming up with. Now, say, unsolicited bidding, uh, you don't have any bid bids to evaluate. You are just a negotiating committee and you negotiate the price. But if you are going with uh, planning, formulation and then b uh, uh, tendering and bid, uh, competitive bidding, it's generally felt that it takes a lot of time. But then uh, the experience, we had uh, in RDA was that even with uh, unsolicited bidding, the same sort of almost the same time is taken. So it's very difficult to say why uh, people say that okay, the proper procedure would take more time. It's not that it takes more time, but it's mostly what I f personally feel is that uh, the finances are not coming. So that you, you have no option other than going for unsolicited proposals with attached conditions. So, so would it be accurate to say that you two are dissatisfied with the current uh, state of affairs when it comes to uh, procurement processes, guidelines, uh, when it comes to mega development projects? Definitely. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Rohan Samarajeeva. Um, Let's talk a bit about the current state of affairs in Sri Lanka. Uh, there are mega development projects uh, being undertaken by the government. Um, do you think that in the list of priorities of the government, building highways 
is uh, to be on the top of the agenda? Well, governments are elected to represent their constituents, right? So I would say that, uh, I mean, I once did a calculation uh, that of all the cars, all the vehicles that were in the country in 2016, one in seven cars had been brought in in 2015. One in 11 three-wheelers, one in 12 two-wheelers and so on. So obviously, the stock of vehicles has increased extraordinarily. People are really frustrated. I can re I remember uh, just in the last two days, uh, one person on social media saying, only the Prime Minister is saying what I want to hear, which is, the Candy Colombo Highway will be, Expressway will be operational in 2020. Now, you see, this is the fundamental contradiction that is giving rise to all these problems. Infrastructure planning, infrastructure uh, implementation is on, the, on a longer time scale. We are talking 5, 10, 15 year cycles. We have to do feasibility, we have to do planning, we have to prioritize. There's a whole series of things that we need to do. The political cycle is, of course, less than five years. So when these two cycles are not in sync, which they are not for all practical purposes, and you don't have a stockpile of plans and, and proposals ready, because in, in a country which has a more coherent infrastructure policy, the permanent structures of the state, the officials, the planners, etc., would be doing their job and they would be having all this documentation ready. And then when a political configuration comes in where which says we can implement, everything is ready and they just implement. Now you saw with Colombo, Metro Colombo development in the previous government, it was all implementation of existing plans, right? Now with this large infrastructures, we don't have the machinery anymore. Now, I know that uh, Road Development Authority, Electricity Board, we have all these people who do long-term planning. We have to do that. But then we have politicians who come in and they don't necessarily agree with the plans because as you've seen with energy, they keep changing the priorities and the energy mix and so on. The politician makes that change, not the technical people. And then with, with, uh, with infrastructure, I think in some cases, I mean, if you take, for example, the Southern Highway, this thing was studied to death. If you take uh, the, the Colombo uh, airport uh, link, there was a lots of studies. But now with these studies, we haven't had the infrastructure to build that necessary background material. And now people are winging it. And uh, I think there's going to be problems because of that. So one of the things that I would add to the earlier conversation is there is this thing called government to government transaction. Now, if you think about the Colombo Katnaika, this was with ADB financing, this was to be a competitive process. Suddenly, somewhere around 2000, the president of that time goes to China and says, okay, this is going to be a government-to-government -government transaction. We are not going through uh, international competitive bidding. So, once you get the government-to-government -government transaction and then countries giving money, Japan and China in particular, you tend to get all these conditions attached. They say it has to be one of our companies. It has to be the companies that we identified. So now all this good theory, good practice, which I completely agree with about competitive procurement goes out the window because now you're in the, in the grip of some other dynamic between two governments. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, <coughs> let's now open the floor for uh, questions from our journalists. Uh, Nadim Majid. Chaturanga Hapu Arachi and Faraz Shaukat Ali are joining us today. Faraz, let's start off with you. Thank you, uh, Sonali. Um, I think uh, we'll take this to uh, Mr. Nimal here. Um, have you been following these uh, uh, processes about uh, procurement? And what strikes me is that this cabinet within the cabinet, the CCEM, seems to have... Um, seems to be interfering. Uh, today we are treated uh, to uh, uh, some information from the Sunday Times about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the power, power sector in which uh, eight companies have bid, two have fallen off, six are there, then there's one chosen and they choose not to open the financial bids of five. Then there's 
a directive from the CCM that in fact they should have a look at the five because of some technical issue with uh, a laptop not working. Um, it seems to me that the CCM is in fact the SCAPC and the TEC and the project committee all rolled into one. Why have the others if, if they're going to poke their nose into it? If your question, <laughs> because it's a government machinery now. It's a so CCM is a uh, newly established uh, organization under this government, which was looking at uh, major projects, probably with best intentions. Uh, but uh, if what you are saying is correct, uh, I don't know. They, they shouldn't have done that because uh, they should have kept themselves involved with the policy. I think not individual nuts and bolts of. Uh, document going and uh, looking at uh, who is eligible and who is not eligible and all that, in my opinion. Uh, well, when I, I was involved in CCEM activities when I was uh, working, uh, we... Which year uh, was that, uh, Mr. Newman? 2015. Right. 2015, I was acting Director General for some time. So, uh, uh, we never felt uh, like that. We had a lively discussion sometimes in the CCEM about certain uh, things, uh, but if you ask what if what you are saying uh, is correct, then I don't I don't think that's good uh, governance. Well, what do you say, Mr. Gunran? Well, um, again, I come back to the procedure, laid down procedure. There is an establishment for this, which is called Department of National Planning, which has the professionals in project planning and capital budgeting. So why don't we let that organization work and call for the proposals, put that one into the machinery of appraisal and then decide which project in which way and which priori with which priority that we implement. So where, where do, where, who decides on uh, li like this uh, section 3 of the highway, the Central Expressway? Who decides that this is required and that it's required by 2020? Who says that? Well, I, I cannot answer to that question who has decided, mm. but the way it should be, I can tell you. Yes, how, how that, should it be? Is that, that the Department of National Planning should call for proposals from various ministries. It's not only highways. You can get it from the railways, you can get it from uh, power, you can get it from the other places because about 5% of the, the GDP is spent as public investment just five percent now with that envelope of five percent that you need to allocate the, the resources uh, to various places now that has to be done diligently and that has to be done so that the public money is not wasted and every rupee that is spent is generating the maximum local value addition and then generating the benefits that are required by the country now for that only this process was laid down in the good old days during the time that uh, President Premadasa was uh, in power and even little later than that, there has been a procedure laid down where there was some uh, mechanism called the Development Secretary's Committee and the Department of National Planning and its DG personally has to go and defend individual projects in front of that committee for the viability. If the viability is not defended in front of that committee, the public money is not voted for that. Now, why can't we uh, uh, use that due diligence in project appraisal? Because this is not something which is, which is, you know, which is simple. We are talking about billions of uh, rupees. But, but what about the, <coughs> the <coughs> sorry, the, the political need, 2020 is suspiciously election time. What about that? The point is this. Political cycle, as Professor Samarajiva says, and the planning cycle in the professional way might not coincide. But that, sh that should not be an excuse for the public money be wasted on, uh, uh, on projects which are, which are, which are uh, implemented on political agenda. Now politicians do come and go. Their mandate is just five years. Now here these projects have gestation periods, maybe two, three mandates of parliaments in, in this country. So, uh, you know, there should be something which at least give that, uh, give that uh, room for the professionals to play. If I may ask you this question. If we do the same thing for the doctors in medical profession, can a politician come up and say, you do the operation this way because of my tenure is over by 2020? Can you do it that way? I mean, you, there, is, uh, 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 there is due diligence in each profession to be exercised. Planning profession, accountancy profession, economics profession, engineering profession and medicine, medical profession. 
So why can't the politicians let down the procedure, lay down the procedure and let the mechanism take its own uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, speed and say, you know, if they want to, they can expedite things, but not short circuit. What is happening is now for political reasons, you short, short circuit and you end up in a, you end up in a mess. Professor Samarajeeva, um, over the recent few weeks, we've heard about a lot of concerns concerning the Central Expressway. Now, another matter that has been brought to light is the proposed construction of the Ruanpura Expressway uh, from Kahatutu to Palmadulla via Horana. Uh, we are told that um, the loan process is still incomplete. However, uh, people in surrounding areas have been issued with notices under uh, the Land Acquisition Act. Um, no environmental impact assessment has been done, no economic feasibility study. Uh, this is according to details um, revealed by uh, the Sunday Times of yesterday. Uh, Professor, how can we just sit and watch while uh, these things uh, take place? Now, what I would say is, uh, let's take, take concrete examples. The Southern Highway, right? You would know better than I do when the planning was started. Right? This was 19, Southern Authority? Yeah, 1990. 1990. And it is the first vehicles go 2011? Yeah. Right? That's too long, we have to admit, right? Mm. That is 21 <laughs> years to get a, a road done, right? So I think we have to, to go and say, we have to also accept that 21 years is not acceptable, right? But this other, swinging to the other extreme and trying to go so fast that you're not doing the necessary uh, feasibility studies, the necessary environmental assessments will cause additional problems, as we have seen with Umawe and places like that. So, you know, we need to find a balance between these. And what I would say is that, you know, we don't have the, the luxury uh, at our stage of development to say, you know, let things take their course and let's work with the money that we have. Now, all this theory can be put in if it's our money that we are spending. Now, anybody who has looked at infrastructure anywhere in the world, including in the United States, says that in most countries, the requirements for infrastructure investment are more than what the countries are actually spending. So we have a shortfall. Now, how do we meet this shortfall? It's when we meet the shortfall that we get into difficulties. What our governments, not one party, but multiple parties, political parties, multiple governments over the last 15 years have done, is they go to Japan, they go to China, they go to some India, and they come with tied money. Not aid, not grants. These are loans, but they are tied in some way. There are some conditions attached to them, which says it has to be one of our suppliers, it has to be from this set, and so on. Sure. Now, your procedures are out, out the window, right? It says you have to do X and Y by certain time in order for the money to be released. That is one possibility. There's another procedure that we could use, which is to mobilize private money. And that has been, now the country which has the greatest number of highways in the world today is not the United States. It's China. China has the largest kilometer length of expressways in the world. The largest uh, high-speed train system, the largest highways so, network. What they did is because the road construction is not a central subject and it's given to the lower level of government and those guys don't have money. So they have all gone with public-private partnerships, right? With mobilizing private money, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Singapore Stock Exchange, they've been mobilizing this money to build these roads. Now, that's another way of doing it. So I think we need to be open to using our own money, number one, if we have, which I say we don't have, using aid money, bilateral or multilateral, multilateral generally tends to be better, they have much better safeguards, or going for public-private partnerships. In all these cases, we really need a huge amount of planning and management capability. Now, we don't have that. We had something called the Board of Infrastructure Investment within the BI, BOI. Somebody closed it down saying we don't need these things anymore. Uh, we had something called the called PERC, Public Enterprise Reform Commission, which had the capability to deal with big transactions. Somebody closed it down saying we don't need these things anymore. So now we've got a government that has been kind of emasculated. Its capacity to do these things has gone down. 
so now we still we are at a stage of development and our people expect not to be stuck in traffic they want to get to candy in three hours instead of four and a half hours so that's the the, the dilemma that we are in we are not ready to deliver uh, what a middle income country requires which is good infrastructure so when we speak about the financing aspects of mega development projects um in when it comes to the central expressway we saw the manner in which uh, a commercial uh, loan had been obtained at exorbitant interest rates uh, with excessive insurance premiums as opposed to the usual process which is you know you take a government to government concessionary loan or uh, whatever the other measures that you mentioned where there's a lengthy repayment period where there's um, um, a grace period the interest rates are really low so um where is this process going wrong professor so i think our whole infrastructure planning our infrastructure policy is uh, broken i mean i keep saying this saying infrastructure po policy doesn't have shouldn't have a political political colors attached to them right because these are long term as we all know these are long term investments so people have got to accept that they can't be changing infrastructure policy all the time but every government right i'm not putting the blame only on this government this government has thrown out thrown out our energy pla energy plans and they said we'll start again we don't want any coal then uh, highways right so we just have this incredible inconsistency then we get to this 5 year 15 year mismatch because if you're trying to reset every 5 years you will have nothing you will only have improvisation or policy and we'll be in trouble and we are in trouble that's the tragedy that we are we are facing Mr. Dr. Kuru uh, I want to ask a question uh, from you uh, now you spoke about the unsolicited uh, proposals that are coming in you said in the first round that that's where we went wrong uh, but we also have a situation when it comes to these mega projects where the bidders don't come forward to actually bid there's only one one company one international company bidding or just uh, two companies and then one all of a sudden goes back and say uh, we can't do it and they withdraw themselves we have that situation as well and then we see a situation where the prime minister says in parliament that there will uh, be no unsolicited bids uh, entertained through a cabinet memo also happening so how do you think that this needs to be coped up because where one situation is where we don't have people coming in and bidding then you are left with no choice but then the government is also in one way saying no we are not going to do that and we want it to be competitive bidding where do we stand there Well, like out of out of the available uh, uh, sort of uh, mechanisms, competitive bidding supposed to be the good one. Yes, yeah. within competitive bidding, you can have that kind of things, which is a uh, uh, collusion, hmm. collusion between certain certain parties, and so they can sort of uh, uh, misguide the, or misdirect the entire uh, situation. Uh, this thing, but then at least we know that th this can happen, and we can have build some safeguards on that, hmm. and then okay, we can cancel the thing and then go for it. And all that. As far as there is no undue haste if there is undue haste because of the uh, mismatch between the electoral process and the planning process there there if you try to have it in 5 years or 4 years or whatever in short circuit uh, procedures then situation might be worse than competitive bidding so competitive bidding is i would say uh, best out of the worst mr chandrasekhar we keeping in mind what we are discussing about this political uh, and the uh, the planning process not being in uh, in line with each other uh, there is another sector that adds up to this problem the bureaucracy that is taking place the, the officials at uh, these various institutions they also have a certain lag or a, or a delay from their point as well that adds up to the whole process as well am i correct yes, in saying no. that or do you disagree no no i agree i agree with that but then uh, that's that's something which can be corrected very easily now mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about uh, having a sort of a uh, uh, projects projects uh, um, um, uh, a body of projects or a library of projects we 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 started that and we have that in uh, uh, road development authority there we have that kind of approach and we have the projects but then the priorities change with the government changes and with the time and all that so the project library The, well, the projects in the library are no, not prioritized. They are in the library. They are in the library forever. Sometimes. So Central Highway, Central Expressway was in the library. 
Central line, we've been Central, talking about yeah, that Central, for a long yeah, exactly. Central Ex Express A was talked about, and it was in the original uh, plan, and, and, and in, in fact, it was in the, um, in the Asian Highway Network also. So it was there, but uh, whether it was uh, planned properly, that's to be seen. Uh, but the system is there. Bureaucracy delay delays due to bureaucracy, of course, is there, but which can be easily tackled. But but uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, you now lots of governments have come and gone. UMP governments, UPFA governments, SLFP governments, the bureaucracy seems to be continuing, the delay seems to be continuing and then isn't that why there are situations where the political mismatch is there? Isn't that why uh, the politicians can come and say look we want this done at this time because the officials do not do their duty properly? The officials to do the uh, duty I think there has, there has to be allocations and money and all that so if, they, if there is no financing there probably will not be any allocation, so it goes at a snail's pace then, because you, you have to use uh, some, some other uh, whatever available money and then do studies and all that. Cannot give a uh, sort of a consultancy outside, so you have to do it inside then. So inside you have a lot of uh, shortcomings and a lot of bureaucracy. So then the, there are, there are so, so many things until financing comes in. Once the financing comes in, it starts sort of accelerating. But we are, if we have a project shelf, and then you are going to pick one from there, then we can do that. But then for a, to plan an express say, uh, as I said, we started 1990, uh, the, uh, initially Southern Highway was started as a highway, not an express say. In 96, we changed it to express say. And then we awarded the contract in 2001. And in 2006, we changed it to a four lane instead of two lane. So all these changes, we finished it in 2011. And the entire trace was changed. Yeah, the trace was changed, changed to a certain certain extent. The Katunayak Expressway, we started planning in 1984. And then we uh, uh, opened it in 2012. So there are but so Ruanpura, many changes. The, that's a new one. Ruanpura, Ruanpura, yeah, Ruanpura, Ruanpura is a new one. one. I don't know where that came from. Yeah, okay. Well, what's yeah. the difference between <laughs> a highway and an expressway then? Highway, you, uh, your speed is basically a speed. Right. So now, say normal, hi normal highway, yeah, you, you have, yeah, exit, yeah, control, yeah, yeah, control uh, access, uh, control access, control may exit. So it's a, it's a con you, that's why you can go at a higher speed also. If there's no controls, right, uh, then you can't go at that speed because that's the you don't have shops on the yeah. two sides and people yeah, begging people into the up and you can't <laughs> exit at every place and no, 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 no entries from a, each and every road. Yeah, so C can I can I ask you this? Um, in your in your years of experience, and maybe, maybe Mr. Gunraman can also say tell us, how often is the incidence of, <coughs> you know, how accurate is the engineer's estimate? Depends on particular projects. Now, say if you take a normal uh, road construction project, it can be almost accurate to up to about say five to ten percent. Right. But if it comes to expressway. Uh, if, it, the, if the terrain is very good, or sort of predictable and all that, then your estimate probably may be up to about 20% to 25%. So how, how do you measure the um, success of the CANC? Is it, um, how, how, how do you measure the success of the CANC? When they award a tender, is it, uh, <coughs> do you look at the engineer's estimate and see how many percent more it's gone up? from the engineer's estimate or do you take the bidder's bid and see how much they've been able to knock them down which which is more accurate or is it i i i, I, would, I would say that okay uh, uh, in a express say now we have done so many expresses now up to now we have done uh, 126 kilometers another 40 uh, 20 and then another 20 almost about 200 kilometers of express we have done right and so we have some ex experience in deciding on the cost involved. Uh, so I would say around 25 percent up to about 25 percent plus or, plus or minus. 25 percent yeah. more than the engineer's estimate. Should be okay. In my opinion, should be okay. So what, what was the final, do you remember what the final bill was for the Southern Expressway? Southern Expressway, it was 115 billion including rupees, including Everything, including a compensation for land acquisition, everything. 115 billion? Billion rupees. For 110 kilometers? 126 kilometers. That's all the way that to Matara. Up to Matara. Up to Matara. I see. So, um, 
we'll be working out how much that is per <laughs> kilometer. Uh, while Farad is doing that, I want to ask a question from you. Now, uh, we speak of these unsolicited proposals that are coming in and how, how uh, the politicians want to you know, manipulate the speed of how the pr project is done. I want to direct the question I uh, asked uh, Mr. Chandasiri as well. The, the officials, don't they have the say and they don't they have the ability to tell these uh, decision makers in parliament look we can't do this by 2020 we need this much of time and we don't have this many uh, allocation do you think the very next day maybe that person will be transferred or something like that will happen yes that's what will happen yes definitely yes so the difference between now and then difference between the good governance government that came into power and the government that the people wanted so badly changed is that these matters come on the Sunday times. That's the only difference that we see there. You see the same things appearing in the newspapers. No change. This is Maitri Palane project uh, uh, of the current president when he was uh, uh, running for the presidency. Mm. Now this shows, this very clearly lays down that this unsolicited proposal business is bad and he says for example, in highways case, he says that Kadavata Keralapiti Adivegi Marge kilometer ekada samastya kles rupial koti hatsi etiha kwaikaran nenam in gasa kana pramane rupial koti pansi avisa pamana ve. So that shows what the president thought when he was running for the presidency, the scale of waste in public money because of unsolicited business. Definitely. Now, how come that under his uh, 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 leadership that the same thing is happening even now is that whether, why is that why whether it is Ruanpur or whether it is uh, Central Expressway how can that that happen not only in the highway sector we have examples to show that in other sectors as well now the same uh, similar kind of situation was reported in Sunday Times on 30th April 2017 this is regarding Matara Beliatta railway line signaling 2,200 million rupees for four stations. 2,200 million Sri Lankan rupees for four stations. And according to uh, uh, the same Sunday Times newspaper on 7th of May, they were saying that the railway department has done Nara Hempita railway signaling for something like 16 million Sri Lankan rupees. With the state of the art signaling. With system. the state of the art signaling. Yeah. Now, I am not engineer to compare which one that technology, this technology. But if it is state of the art technology for 16 million for Narahem Peter, for four stations in between Matra and Beliata should be maximum 64 million Sri Lankan rupees as far as I am concerned. How can there be 2,200 million? Now that is why I disagree with Professor Samarajiva that money is not the issue. Look at this money. 2,200 million Sri Lankan rupees, even if you take it at 3% interest. I am sure these are commercial loans, these are not soft loans. So, uh, uh, it must be figuring out somewhere down there, 2 to 3 percent uh, interest rate. Even if it is 3 percent, if you take it, 2,200 million, 3 percent is 66 million Sri Lankan rupees, just the interest alone. So, with one year's interest, you one year's interest, which the government pays anyway. Hmm. So, government cannot say that government has no money. It with one year's interest, you could have done the whole four station signaling in within local technology by the Sri Lanka Railway, by uh, our people without getting indebted. And now you get indebted for 2,200 million. And then you say, now we are, uh, you know, heavily indebted. And then you sell Hamburg to the port to someone to settle the debt. What's the purpose? Now you rush certain things and say that we want to uh, come into a political platform and uh, the, the political cycle to uh, uh, coincide with the planning cycle and then you get into unwanted debt trap and then finally you shout like Kano Kano Kieno Anaya Sakwida. Now this is not, this is not right. But, uh, I've got, I'll just uh, thank you for let, give me some time to work these figures out, right? But this is absolutely astonishing. You told us that 126 kilometers including the land acquisition cost 115 billion rupees at that time i think the dollar was around 130 no it was about at the time of the first contract i think it was about 87 or 89 okay in 2001 and then we are in 2011 i think it was about 112 all right if i if i did it at 130 it works out at approximately 7 million dollars a kilometer if i put your Low figure in, it probably goes yes. up to about 10 million dollars yeah. a kilometer. 
Well, 134 billion is the uh, the final negotiated price with uh, one of these companies with on the Central Expressway. That's a 32.5 kilometers. That gives me a total in, at current exchange rates of 150 to the dollar, 27.4 million dollars. I know there are a few mountains in between Colombo and Kandy, and they may not have had so many mountains between here and Matra, but it sounds to me an astonishing difference. <laughs> without, without looking at the entire the project, I can't say anything about the cost. But yes, uh, the, um, uh, the it's more than terrain, terrain you are referring to from Kurunagara to uh, Galagadar yeah. is mountainous yeah. and uh, there are a lot of tunnels probably involved mm. and uh, the cost may be generally high. Yes. That's generally, generally speaking, may be high. More but than on double. The, yeah, on the other hand, 50% uh, of the Southern Expressway was on Mars. Right. So we had to develop that Mars. So there is additional cost in developing the Mars. But including all that, it was Yeah, including all that, it was, it was then at that time, it was, uh, it was now that 750 or it's 115 billion includes the costs we had to pay through arbitration. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have include, included the cost we paid through negotiate, negotiating in settling, uh, settling certain claims. They are made by the contractor. So, with all that, only that uh, came to 115 billion. So, the, 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 the likelihood of 134 billion becoming 160 billion is not entirely. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, you should, I would say, yeah, we should examine it in depth. Well, well, what's case. the rule of thumb? How, how much do you ex expect price escalations? Uh, or, or not no. really price escalations, yeah. but un yeah, um, unplanned or, or planned extra expenditure, mm -hmm. like you just said, arbitration. So let me let me tell you something because Guru um, uh, came up with this uh, OCH three cost, the seven billion per kilometer. Now we completed uh, Southern High Express around say thousand mil uh, million um, uh, a kilometer, one billion a kilometer, let's say rupees. Yeah, and then uh, outer circular highway second first part, it was on competitive bidding and there were Chinese and uh, Japanese uh, bidding uh, competitively and we ended up with 2 billion a kilometer in outer circular highway first uh, section and outer circular highway second section came in and it was uh, only Japanese contractors with a Japanese uh, step loan. We, are, we have a condition where the only Japanese contractors can come in and then uh, the raw material percentage has to be brought uh, in from Japan. So it ended up with 4 billion a kilometer initial contract. Then it went into OCH3, it became 7 billion. Can I, can I make a point here, uh, if you permit? Uh, why are we talking about Japan, China, Korea, India? If we need the particular section of highway, with or without money, you can go for competitive bidding. For example, in 2015, a mechanism was proposed to the government of Sri Lanka by Honorable Ranjit Madhuma Bandara as the Minister of uh, uh, Transport at that time. If you want to develop, or if you want to develop a railway or highway or whatever, put that into competitive bidding and let the bidder come up with his own credit. So ja Japanese people can come with Japanese money, Chinese people can come up with Chinese money, Indian people can come up with Indian money. And then we can sit and evaluate the, the, the bids. So with or without money, you can go for competitive bidding. Now the whole problem is, there is an excuse saying we don't have money. Number one, I showed you that we don't have money is not an excuse because finally we end up paying that or even more with our own money. Even if that claim that money is not available is true, still for all, you can call for bids Particular contractors can come up with their own credit and then we can evaluate. Why isn't the government doing that is a big question mark and that is definitely not fitting into Yaha Palane, a good governance agenda. That much I can say. And there's Thank a lot you. of money hanging around in sales. Yes, so for so. example, now this is, a, this, is a, this is an example that we have done a cost comparison in, 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 in our, one of our researchers. This yellow band 
is those highway projects which are funded by Korea and China. These are not expressways, these are just highways. Mm -hmm. Even ordinary highways, this is the kind of level of uh, 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 um, uh, uh, average cost, specific cost per kilometer when other ADB, World Bank and government, government of Sri Lanka is the lowest, mm. obviously, that's the, that's the, the, the cheapest source that we can find, uh, uh, the, the most economical way of financing highways, but this, look at this, uh, uh, the level, which is, which is nearly uh, three to four times more expensive than uh, other, other donors coming with uh, competitive bidding. Now, ADB and World Bank is definitely competitive bidding. Right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lalita Siri Gunaruan. On that note, we go in for a short commercial break. We're discussing mega development projects and corruption and its correlation. Stay with us.